much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. I have to tell you, I love this conference. It is so unusual, and you may not realize how unusual it is for scientists, physicians, and parents to all come together to talk with each other, tell each other what we know, to learn from each other. I think it's wonderful, and I'm so pleased and privileged to be a part of it. So thank you, Sid, John, and Bernie. So today I'm going to talk to you about moms, methylation, and mitochondria, and our evidence for epigenetic dysregulation and mitochondrial dysfunction in autism. And if you've never heard the word epigenetics, don't worry about it because you're going to learn a lot about it in just a few minutes. This is an overview of what I'm going to be telling you today. I'm going to start out reviewing our um, published evidence on an abnormal profile, a plasma metabolic profile, that we've seen in moms as well as in children with autism. And as you'll see, the pattern is a little bit different, but in both cases, we're seeing a reduced methylation capacity and a reduced antioxidant uh, or detoxification capacity. This is related to glutathione metabolism. And then I'll talk to you and explain what epigenetics is. And it involves the regulation of gene expression. And the two major mechanisms I'm going to talk about are DNA methylation and histone chromatin modifications. Um, and so I will spend a little bit of time uh, getting you up to speed on these new uh, issues. And then we'll get to the mom's connection. And this is some recent evidence. We've just actually submitted this for publication in the American Journal for Medical Genetics. And what we found is an increased frequency of a, this RFC1 gene polymorphism. And this is a gene that codes for the reduced folate carrier. And that's the protein that transports folate inside the cells. And we're seeing an elevated LA frequency in the mothers, but not the fathers and not the kids. So that brings up a new concept of the mother, perhaps, in some cases, as the genetic case. And her genetics may be as important uh, as the child's genetics. And We'll also show how this RFC1 polymorphism is related to DNA hypomethylation, and that's the epigenetic connection I'll be making. I also want to show you our um, data in looking inside the cells. The, our metabolic profile is in the plasma, and that really is more of a systemic reflection. So the question is, is what we see in the plasma also occur inside the cell? And so I'll show you that data. That was published this earlier this year in the FASHEB journal, and we look at the cytosolic and also mitochondrial glutathione redox status. And this is in lymphoblastoid cell lines that are derived from autistic children. And then I'll end with some new evidence. I'm actually working on this paper now um, where, where we're seeing uh, evidence for both DNA and protein oxidative damage. And the reason this is important is our plasma profile really talked about potential for vulnerability to uh, oxidative stress. And this data actually confirms that proteins are more oxidized and DNA is more oxidized in the autistic children compared to the controls. So let's get started. I'm going to, as I said, I'll start out showing you our evidence for why we think there's decreased methylation and glutathione uh, capacity in both the moms and the children. And this involves three metabolic pathways. Um, many of you have heard it before, but for the new moms, I'll quickly review folate, methionine, and glutathione metabolism. And this is what we do in the lab. We measure those metabolites with pretty sophisticated um, instruments. Uh, for those of you that may not, again, I'm not sure what the background is, but for those of you that may not understand what a metabolic pathway is or haven't heard of it, it's, it's simply a series or a sequence of metabolic reactions where the enzyme will tack something on, pull something off, uh, a molecule, break it apart, put it back together again, making a new molecule, which is then... Uh, altered by yet another enzyme, and it goes on and on, and this is basically um, the biochemistry of life. And this particular pathway, we think, uh, may have significant contribution uh, to, or specific for children with autism. 
So this is our pathways, and as I said, there are three pathways, and the first one is called the folate cycle. And THF stands for tetrahydrofolate, and I'm particularly interested in this methyl group uh, with the circle. Um, do I have a, no, I don't, um, on 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And in this enzyme reaction, methionine synthase takes that methyl group from folate, transfers it first to B12, making the infamous methyl B12, and then the methyl group is transferred to homocysteine, and that makes, turns it into methionine. So that's the first pathway. The second pathway uh, involves the activation of methionine to um, S adenosyl methionine, or SAM, and this is a very important molecule because this is the source of methyl groups for all the cellular methyl essential cellular methylation reactions, and this includes DNA methylation, RNA protein, phospholipid methylation. So this enzyme, and it's actually transferring the methyl group that it picked up over here from folate, transfers that methyl group. Once it gives up the methyl group, it becomes something called SAH, or S-adenosyl homocysteine, and then another enzyme breaks it apart, and now homocysteine is ready for another cycle. And the importance of this cycle is that it's a way the cell has to keep methionine levels high uh, for ongoing protein synthesis and for these essential methylation reactions. And then the final pathway is called transsulfuration. And here homocysteine leaves the methionine cycle, is converted into B6 dependent steps to cysteine, and you've heard of cysteine earlier today. Cysteine is the rate-limiting amino acid for the synthesis of glutathione. And I'm showing you glutathione in its two forms. GSH is the active form. It's the sulfhydryl group that donates that hydrogen to quench free radicals or to detoxify mercury or lead or heavy metals. That's the active form. Um, the inactive form is GSSG, and that's where two GSHs have given up their hydrogens and now they're linked at that sulfur group. That has to be reactivated or resynthesized back to GSH to become active again. And this ratio is, this is an equilibrium reaction. The, the, the equilibrium needs to be far to the left so that there's at least a hundredfold excess of the active glutathione to the oxidized or inactive glutathione. So that's it. Our folate cycle then leads to the methionine cycle and down transsulfuration to glutathione synthesis. This ratio of the methyl donor, SAM, to SAH, which is actually a product inhibitor, is our indication of the methylation capacity of that individual. The ratio of the active form of uh, glutathione, GSH, to the oxidized form is this antioxidant redox detoxification uh, potential. Again, we measure these in um, the lab and we're able to come up with a indication of status in the kids and the moms. Now I've got these red arrows and that this first just showing the what we're seeing in many of the kids and as you know it's never a hundred percent. On average we see this pattern and of course there are many kids that don't have this pattern but it's remarkable that we're seeing it as often as we do. So we see in many kids a low methionine and a low SAM. This is the methyl donor. And as I'll show you, DNA hypomethylation in the children. Down at the bottom, we see in many kids low cysteine and a shift in this redox ratio, um, GSH to GSSG. In the moms, now I'm going to talk about the moms, we see an increase in SAH. And this is very unusual and I'm not sure I understand why, but it is there in at least 40% of the moms. It's very uh, unusual but very interesting. And the importance is that when SAH goes up, like I said, it's a product inhibitor. So it blocks the methyltransferase. So in that case, in the moms, it's really the SAMSA ratio is driven by the increase in SAH so the ratio is down. In the kids, the SAM is down, and rarely, but about 10% of the time, SAH is up in the kids. Homocysteine is high in many, in many of the moms as well, and this may be the reason that SAH goes up, because 
that when, when homocysteine's up, that reaction reverses. So that will cause, when homocysteine's up, it'll cause the SAH to go up, and then you've got the problem with the uh, product inhibition. We do see a decrease in the redox ratio as well in the mom. So you can see it's a little bit different, but in both cases, um, we have decreased methylation, SAMHSA, and decreased um, redox, GSH, GSSG. But today I'm gonna focus on the upper part, the methionine transmethylation and this methylation potential, because this is the connection with epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Well, it's how cells control, change, maintain gene expression. It's how cells turn on genes and how they turn off genes. And this process is heritable. And interestingly, which makes it unique, it does not involve a change in DNA sequence, which is kind of counterintuitive because we think of mutations and a problem with uh, gene expression because there's been a base change. This does not involve a change in DNA sequence. It's different and actually much more dynamic. And the two main mechanisms, as I'm going to explain, are DNA methylation and histone modification. Histones are the proteins that are tightly um, associated with DNA, and their amino acid, we call tail, that protrudes from the DNA can be modified. And I'll show you how that is really what controls gene expression. Um, there's a good analogy that I think, because this is counterintuitive, um, if you think of the DNA sequence as the hard drive, then epigenetics is the software that determines whether, how, and when the sequence will be read. It's also another very important aspect of DNA methylation is it's responsible for what we call tissue-specific gene expression. If you think about it, every cell in the body has all Oops. all the genes for every, every gene. Uh, and, but, for instance, in the liver, the liver knows only to express the genes important for liver. The kidney, for example, knows only to express the genes for kidney. The reason for that is, in the liver, all the other genes are turned off by DNA methylation. So this process of how cells know who they are and what to do occurs very, very early in embryogenesis where these DNA methylation patterns are laid down in the mother, uh, in the environment of the mother, uh, very early. So DNA methylation is uh, extremely interesting and it's just actually coming into its own, I think, um, in the last decade. Actually, it started with cancer research and, and, and it's really completing a circle for me because I studied DNA methylation and in cancer um, before I got to autism. So this is actually extremely interesting to me. So how might it apply to autism? Well, we come back to our methylation potential, our SAMHSA ratio that I just explained to you. The methyl groups that are transferred to DNA and to the histones are coming from SAM. And, and there, that enzyme is inhibited by SAH. So the low ratio that we're seeing in many of the kids and many of the moms um, relates then to epigenetics and the methylation of histones and DNA. And these patterns um, are heritable, and they're heritable within an individual between, um, cell, between cell generations. It's not like from mother to child, it's within um, an individual. Once it's changed, it's heritable. But these patterns can be modified by diet, deficiencies, for example, toxic exposures, oxidative stress, the environment. And so it's really, epigenetics is at the interface between genes and environment, which sounds a lot like autism. So this field of epigenetics and autism, I think, um, is really important, and again, is in its infancy, but I think may, may explain a lot of things that the genetics so far have not been able to explain. Um, so this, again, the, this regulation, this on-off ability, um, provides what we call phenotypic plasticity, and that means the ability to respond, of an individual to change gene expression in response to an environmental uh, cue, for example, and it allows this flexibility within a fixed 
DNA sequence. So it really is epigenetics. Okay. Got a little sore throat here. <clears> throat> Excuse me. So uh, this is a diagram that I think will you know, help you visualize and, 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 and get a better perspective. If we start at the bottom, uh, there is a chromosome we're all familiar with, one chromatids from mom, one's from dad, and if we start unwinding and focusing in, we come to chromatin. And chromatin is this histones that have DNA wrapped tightly around it, and you can see these little tails coming out, and they're going to become important in the next slide. That's, they're very important for this regulation. So this is the histones. If we steep, keep going on, we see the double helix, and then up at the top, we're at double-stranded DNA. And I'm pointing out here that the methyl, methyl groups are not just random. They're only on cytosines in DNA, and only cytosines that occur at CG dinucleotides. That's the signal for the DNA methyltransferase to transfer that methyl group uh, to the DNA. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison, again, just to help you um, really understand and pick, pick up on, on the difference. On the left, we have what we're very familiar with, um, which is DNA that has been exposed to whatever um, and sustained a mutation that is not repaired. That mutation, that base change, is heritable. Once it's in there and it's not repaired, that is transferred to your child. That is transgenerational uh, inheritance. Epigenetics is different, and here I've got the DNA and the histones, the two major components, and the DNA, I'm showing the methyltransferase, transferring the methyl groups to the DNA, and the histones being modified, the PTM is post-translational modification, and this is, call, this is um, creating, again, what we're calling phenotypic plasticity, and it's fascinating. This is, as I said, a heritable form of cell memory, of adaptive changes. Um, it's how liver cells know how to be liver cells. Um, how, uh, a good example, another good example is T cell, memory T cells. They're ready to go. They have been modified, their DNA is modified so that they're good to go. There's no processing. That's a memory. And there's some fascinating uh, mouse work looking at synaptic memory, how we remember, um, showing that when a, a mouse is uh, fear conditioned, the DNA methylation in the hippocampus is changed. It's, again, this is very, very new, very, very much in its infancy, but if it pans out, it's, it's, it's huge. It could explain um, instinct. It could explain habits. It could um, explain addiction um, and how we remember. So again, this is a, I think, fascinating area um, that we'll see what uh, the future brings, but I think the potential is, is really very huge. Okay, here's another. I like to use the visualization because it, it helps, I think, um, see what I'm talking about. Here we have the chromosome again, the, the chromatin, which is often called beads on a string, and then the components of the chromatin are called nucleosomes, and there's the DNA wrapped around the histones, and then on the top half, it shows a histone with those modification. That's the amino acid tail that's protruding out. It can be acetylated, methylated, phosphorylated, and some other things, but we're going to just focus for simplicity on acetylation and methylation to understand gene expression. And then in the bottom there, it's showing um, DNA methylation, which is the cytosine there, the methyltransferase, and there's that red methyl group transferred uh, from SAM to cytosines in DNA. And together, that's called epigenetic. Those are the epi major epigenetic mechanisms. Okay, so down at the bottom, now we're getting to it, is how genes are switched on and switched off. The top part there is it shows a, a, a chromatin where the, the um, histones are acetylated, and not meth and the DNA is not methylated. When you have acetylated histones, that acetyl group creates a negative charge that repels the DNA and basically opens the DNA making it accessible to transcription factors. It's that easy. It's just all about accessibility. When it's open, the transcription factor can get in, start RNA synthesis, start gene expression. 
Underneath it is an example of a gene that's turned off, and I'm really talking about promoter regions here. You see it's lost its acetyl group, so it's not being repelled and opened, and the DNA has become methylated, and it's in a much more closed conformation, and the transcription factors can't get in. That gene is turned off. So there's hypomethylation, uh, acetylation, genes are on or open, and when they're methylated and closed, that gene won't be transcribed. And here's just one more showing, adding the SAM saw. Uh, again, here's a cytosine without the methyl group, and it occurs in that CG dinucleotide. With the SAM, the DNA methyltransferase picks up the SAM and trans oops, transfers it to the cytosine, creating the methylated DNA. When SAH is high, and this is our concern in what we're seeing in many of the moms, it blocks, as I said, it's a product inhibitor, it blocks that methyltransferase, and now you can actually lose methyl groups and cause genes that should be turned off to be turned on, so inappropriate gene expression when the methyl groups uh, are not um, transferred appropriately. Okay, so the importance here, again, as I've stressed, in general, and, and again, I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible because it conceptually it really isn't. Um, when the promoter regions of genes are methylated, in general, they're turned off, and if they are unmethylated, those genes are turned on, and this is, um, as I said, tissue-specific gene expression. The normal development in, of the fetus, and actually it's very early in embryogenesis, depends on these patterns of DNA methylation that are important for tissue-specific gene expression to be sure that the genes that should be turned off are turned off. And this is where we, we, get, we bring in the maternal microenvironment, the in utero environment, uh, is very important so that what is needed is there, the methyl groups, for this basic setup of methylation patterns. Um, Chromosome stability and integrity. Uh, the methyl, the pericentromeric region is heavily methylated, and the reason it's thought is that it keeps the DNA during meiosis or mitosis. It keeps that DNA very stable, so that, there, that it facilitates the chromosome segregation. So DNA methylation is very important in chromosome stability. The extra X that all women have is inactivated. You only express the genes on one X chromosome. The other X chromosome is heavily methylated, and those genes are turned off. So again, it's very functional. Um, and you may have heard of imprinted genes where only the maternal or only the paternal allele are expressed. That's again an example in many cases of methylation. If the paternal gene is expressed, the maternal gene can be methylated. So again, this is gene expression. And another uh, important issue is suppression of viral insertions. Um, methylation will, will come right in and turn off uh, viral uh, insertions. Some of the consequences of hypo or insufficient methylation, again, as I said, it's so important, uh, this pericentromeric region, chromosome instability is uh, one issue. Um, again, hypomethylation or loss of methyl groups in a promoter of a gene can cause a gene that should be turned off to be turned on inappropriately. And hypermethylation, the inappropriate methylation in a promoter region can turn off a gene that should be turned on. Uh, it also, uh, if insufficient methylation capacity can cause a failure to methylate viral insertions or can, if it's lost, can reactivate, and these are mainly done in, in animal studies, but it's an interesting concept. Again, just to give you an idea of, of how DNA methylation is quite critical. Okay, so now I think we're ready to talk about our, our new paper, um, and this, again, is, is the mom's connection. And we're looking at this a functional Poly, uh, functioning polymorphism in the RFC1 gene and its association with DNA hypomethylation in the moms. And again, we've just 
submitted that to American Journal of Medical Genetics. And I think what this paper may do, or I think what it implies, is perhaps we need to broaden the paradigm for gene-environment interaction uh, in autism. I mean, we're all very familiar with, and actually all of the genetic uh, studies are focused on the child. And, uh, and we, we all would agree there's a genetic, uh, clearly a genetic predisposition that requires or may require an environmental trigger. That's postnatal. But let's think about the maternal genetics. And, and this, again, involves in utero environment. So any change in, if, if there is a, a, that the mother's genetic profile or epigenetic abnormalities will affect her metabolism and could act prenatally as an in utero environmental factor to affect the development of the fetus. And this is a sort of broadens uh, the concept. And specifically, uh, we think that polymorphisms uh, or environmental exposures that affect this pathway that we think is so uh, important in autism uh, could alter the placental and in utero microenvironment to affect normal fetal DNA synthesis, methylation, gene expression, neurodevelopment, development in general. Um, and this is important because if we're aware of it, uh, we know that this abnormal uh, transmethylation metabolism is treatable and preventable. So basically what we're saying is let's think about the mother as a potential genetic case. And, and this is not uh, unheard of for sure. Um, there are other examples of genetic or epigenetic variation that where the mother's unaffected but the child uh, is affected through uh, this abnormal uh, in utero, if you will, uh, environment. Uh, in birth defects, uh, spina bifida, Down syndrome have been shown to be associated with abnormalities in the maternal microenvironment. Um, beckmuth wiedemann syndrome, Angelman syndrome, again, imprinted genes, that's a methylation abnormality. Fragile X, RH, and let's think of the possibility of possibly autism as well. Um, some environmental factors that have been shown uh, to, sh to affect maternal um, Methylate, or fetal methylation and maternal exposures are folate deficiency, viral infection, valproic acid, alcohol, mercury, and arsenic. So these are common exposures um, where the maternal exposure could affect the methylation of the, uh, of the fetus. So this is what we did in the study, and, it, and actually it was huge. It, we, we, had, we could obtain these, um, this DNA from NIMH, National Institutes of Mental Health, uh, repository. And we uh, had 500 what we call case parent trios, which is basically 1,500 samples, uh, mother, father, child, and we also had 500 controls. And we genotyped them specifically for polymorphisms that have been shown to affect this metabolic profile. Um, many of you are familiar with MTHFR. There are two um, polymorphisms there. That, that enzyme affects the synthesis of 5-methylfolate. TC2 is transcobalamin 2. That codes for the protein that, uh, that uh, transports B12 into the cell, so that's very relevant. Um, MTRR keeps the methionine synthase uh, enzyme in an active form. And RFC1, reduced, carrier, reduced folate carrier 1, is the protein that transports folate into the cell. So these were very uh, deliberately selected as possibly uh, related to the abnormal profile. And then we applied uh, some rather so sophisticated statistical um, tests, the trans transmission disequilibrium test and this maximum likelihood ratio test. And this will help us determine whether the, the variant allele is operating through the mother and or through the child. And these are standard um, statistical methods. And we also measured, as I said, the uh, maternal uh, methylation metabolites. So just to give you, cut to the chase here before I show you the, the actual results, we saw no difference in four of the five genes that we looked at. Um, for the MTHFR, either of the MTHFRs, the transcobalamin 2, or the MTRR. And I, I, I actually, since we just submitted to American Journal of Medical Genetics, I was 
I was interested to see that they are no longer accepting papers that have fewer than 500 ends per, per group. Uh, I wish we did, thank goodness. Um, so these small studies are, can be misleading, I guess, is, is the take home message. But when you have um, 2,100 samples, which we had for each one of these, we, we think this is pretty close to reality. But we did find the RFC1G, which is the variant allele frequency, increased above in the mothers, but not the fathers or the case children. And the metabolites were abnormal. And this slide just shows you where RFC1 acts. As I said, it's the protein that um, brings 5-methylfolate into the cell. And I've just added the arrows of what you might anticipate if there's less folate entering the cell. It's interesting, so that's basically similar to, to what we're seeing. So it's, again, this is an association uh, that we're seeing. It's certainly, we can't say anything about causality, but we're looking at for this association. So here are the genotype frequencies, and let me just walk you through it. This is a case control study, again, where we had over 500 cases, 500 controls, mother, case, child, and father. And I've highlighted the important ones. And here is the mother at the top. The G allele frequency was significantly increased, and both the heterozygote and homozygote, AG and GG, and the combination were highly significantly elevated in the mom. In the child, we're seeing case control, a significant increase in the heterozygote and the combination, nothing in the homozygote in this study. Um, and we think that that probably reflects the fact that they're getting it from, uh, he's getting it, or the child's getting it from the elevated frequency in the mother. The father, nothing. Uh, RFC1 has nothing to do with the... Um, with the father's uh, genotype. There's no variation compared to controls. So this is the transmission disequilibrium test, and it's, uh, you don't need to understand any more of it than it's, it allows us to determine whether the G allele is coming more often from the mother or from the father. And what we're showing here, it's not, the P is 0.15, it's not sig statistically significant, but it shows that it, more often it's, it's transmitted through the mother and not at all uh, from the father. And again, this is, you, you can't do this um, statistics unless you have mother, father, child, the trio, um, the, the uh, genotypes. And then this is this, um, what we call maximum likelihood ratio test. And this test is, again, a statistical test. If you've got all three genotypes and it's capable of differentiating where the genetic risk is, is it operating through the child? and the mother or the mother. And ov over here on the left, R1 and R2, it, it's giving you the genetic relative risk if the child inherits one G allele or two. And what the p-value is telling us is it, it, it's not associated with the, with the genetic risk. But if we look at S1, S2, if the mother is carrying one or two alleles, the risk is, is highly significant. Uh, in the mom. And then this likelihood ratio is basically looking to see whether the genetic risk is operating through the mom or the child. So in, for the offspring, it removes the effect of the maternal genotype and what do we have left? And it's saying nothing. It doesn't matter what the child's genotype is. Um, the maternal likelihood ratio, if we remove the effect of the child, is highly significant. So here it is, once again, without all the numbers, the risk of the child inheriting uh, one or two alleles, we're not seeing it's not associated with risk. Whereas if the mother inherits one or two alleles, it's highly associated. And the maternal, the child effect was not significant. The maternal effect was highly significant. So in this case, for this genotype, it's really the mother that is the important uh, genetic case, not the child, for um, RFC1. So this is just showing our pathway that I, that I walked you down previously, just making the point that if you affect one side, and here I've got the RFC1 uh, on, on the folate side, remember that folate, that methyl group that is transferred to DNA is actually derived from folate, so you can't separate them. So if you have a problem with the folate cycle, 
uh, you're going to have problems with methylation as well. So here now then is our um, data. And we're looking at 57 uh, moms and 80 control moms. We published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disabilities a preliminary report. This is a completely, s that, that shows the same thing actually. And it's very comforting when you see the same thing occurring in a completely different cohort. So these are different moms, different control moms. And we're seeing essentially the same thing, um, which is a decrease in their methionine levels. Their SAM levels are fine. And remember, it was the SAM in the kids that was low. But in the moms, the SAM levels are fine. It's SAH that is just so unusually elevated in the moms. Uh, quite elevated and highly significant. So the ratio then is decreased, but it's being driven by the SAH, not the SAM. Homocysteine and adenosine, those were the products there, are both high, and I, that's the best explanation uh, I can come up with, and we don't have a clue why they're high, but that'll drive the SAH up, because when they're high, that reaction goes backwards and increases um, SAH levels. And remember, SAH is the product inhibitor. Folate levels were down in the moms. It's not a huge decrease, but at least it's consistent with um, a problem with uh, folate uptake. So I just have your arrows there. And then this is just looking at all the data, and I think gives us, again, a little more insight. Um, on the left panel A, we're showing that as homocysteine goes, as folate goes down, homocysteine goes up, and that's well established uh, in the literature, but we're seeing it in the moms as well. And B, we're showing that as homocysteine goes up, SAH goes up, which is what I was explaining, that reversal of that reaction. So this, this data makes sense with the fact that it may be the homocysteine that's driving up the SAH. And then in uh, panel C, we're looking at adenosine, which again is one of those products that is a product that will reverse that reaction. And we're seeing as adenosine goes up, SAH goes up. And then in panel D, um, it's showing very clearly that it's SAH that's driving that methylation ratio down. So as SAH goes up, that ratio drops dramatically. And then we measured, after, after seeing that, uh, we worked up, which was no mean feat, but we worked up the method for looking at 5-methylcytosine in DNA, and, and it's expressed as the percent 5-methylcytosine of total cytosine. Um, and this is looking at the repository DNA, and we're showing that, in the, that the mothers with the GG genotype have lower total 5-methylcytosine content compared to controls, which is really very interesting. And, and here is a separate set. This is our local moms where we have the SAH and the DNA methylation. So you can see that the DNA methylation, again, in the blue, is decreased in the case mothers, as is the SAMSAW ratio. Again, this is an association. Um, it's tempting to say it's causal, but we can't say that. We simply can say it's, it's associated, but it's very, very interesting. We also looked at after we saw it in the moms, we looked at it in the kids, and we're seeing also the same pattern, where in the blue, DNA methylation is down, and in those children, SAMHSA ratio is also down. So this, to me, is, is, again, we had the potential, we had the ratio, we had the vulnerability, but this shows that that decrease in SAMHSA ratio is associated with a functional outcome, and in this case, it's um, DNA methylation. So these are some of the methylation issues in children with autism that could be affected. Now, the phospholipid content of the membrane, um, phosphatidylethanolamine to phosphatidylcholine, requires three SAM methyl groups. So potentially, again, this is some, something that needs to be looked at, the PEPC ratio in the membrane, we would anticipate that it would be down. In, or I'm sorry, up, increased phosphatidylethanolamine the precursor, phosphatidylethanolamine, is not being converted to phosphatidylcholine. Carnitine synthesis is another example, requires three SAM methyl groups. 
Creatine, uh, again, uh, this is the energy uh, phosphocreatine and requires three SAM methyl groups. And myelin in uh, the brain requires a SAM-dependent methylation of that protein. So these are some potential issues. Now I want to show you our data inside the cells, um, where we have uh, used lymphoblastoid cell lines. And, and we use these because we can't get enough lymphocytes to, to do these measurements directly out of the child. So, uh, Autism Research Genetic Exchange, AGREE, has a huge repository of these lymphoblastoid cell lines, and so this is what we used um, for this data. So we took um, cell lines for, that we got from AGREE, and I wanted to mention also that these cell lines, for, to, to qualify for this repository, um, the, the child has to have at least one uh, affected sibling, so there's two kids in the family, so that says that it's probably these cell lines are highly genetically predisposed. So we took the cell lines and we did them in pairs, uh, the control and the autistic, and cultured them under identical conditions. And then we measured the rate of free radical production inside the cell and the redox ratio um, at baseline. And then we used thimerosal as adding it in vitro as oxidative stress, because thimerosal is well known to bind and deplete glutathione. So here are results um, inside the cells now, looking at our redox ratio. And on the left, um, we're showing uh, the burgundy is the autistic cell lines, looking measuring GSH, GSSG, and we see GSH is down and the GSSG is up. And on the right, then, as you would predict, the ratio is down. So this. Again, it's in lymphoblastoid cell lines. Um, we can't say it's true in every cell. We don't know what's going on in the brain. But at least um, for lymphoblastoid cell lines, what we're seeing in the plasma is reflected inside the cell. This is a cool experiment. Um, this is looking at free radical, oxygen free radical generation in real time. And what we do is we take the cells and expose them to something called DCF, dichlorofluorescine. And this is a molecule that will not fluoresce. You can load the cells with it. It won't fluoresce until it's hit by a free radical, and then it'll give a fluorescent signal. So we load the cells, we put them in a fluorimeter, and we see what kind of signal we get. And autistic is in the cell lines or in the burgundy. And you can see at baseline, that's with just nothing. Just take them out, read them. Um, free radical generation in real time is higher in the autistic compared to the control cells. And then as we add increasing doses of thimerosal, and this is micromolar, we're seeing that pattern maintained, which is not really what I thought we'd see. I thought we'd see an exaggerated response when we added thimerosal. No, if you, if you look at it, it's being driven by what's happening at baseline. It's already there. And we add the oxidative stress, and it's maintained, but it's not an exaggerated overreaction, which was quite interesting. So cells from, derived from autistic children are generating more free radicals than the control cells, on average. If we look at the ratio inside these cells, same cells, at baseline, you can see the same thing. That ratio is much lower in the autistic than in the control cell lines, and that's maintained as we add oxidative stress. So we're showing a decrease in that ratio inside the cells. Um, this slide I added because it is showing you can actually go down to nanomolar levels of thimerosal. The previous slides were micromolar for three hours, which is convenient for an eight-hour day um, to do the complete experiment. If we, we can go down to nanomolar levels, but we have to go longer. So after 24 hours at nanomolar, we're basically seeing the same pattern. Again, it's, it's driven by baseline. And then we looked inside the inside of the cells. And that it was a, quite an undertaking. We um, needed 20 million cells to get enough mitochondria to be able to measure it and to figure out how to measure it uh, without shifting that um, ratio was, was, again, a challenge. But this is quite interesting, I think, that 
inside the mitochondria, which is where we think the free radicals are, are coming from. That's the electron transport chain, and, and free radicals escape all the time, and under oxidative stress, they, ex they, they escape even uh, at a greater frequency. So we're showing here, then, that the redox imbalance is down inside the mitochondria. GSSG is up, which is interesting, too, because mitochondria can't export GSSG. That's just a a fact, um, so it does build up, and the ratio is decreased comparing the autistic with the control cell lines. We also looked at what's called the mitochondrial membrane potential, and we used, uh, we exposed them to nitric oxide, a nitric oxide generator, and we're showing, and this is, a, again, a, a specific dye that will reflect the membrane potential, which is the health, if you will, of the mitochondria. And what we're seeing, I have to point out, this was transient, but within the first hour, three hours, we're seeing a much greater decrease in membrane potential when they are exposed to oxidative stress. After 24 hours, it's come back. But it says, perhaps, that these cells are more labile, or these mitochondria are more labile uh, in, in terms of being exposed to um, oxidative stress. So we conclude then that because they, these cell lines were cultured under identical conditions, identical media, the differences we see um, before and after exposure to oxidative stress must reflect an inherent genetic or epigenetic difference. And we think that this may provide evidence that cells from autistic children may be more vulnerable to pro-oxidant environmental exposures. So now I want to show you, just in the last couple of minutes here, um, our evidence for pro-oxidant oxidative damage in the kids. And here uh, I'm comparing uh, the glutathione ratio that we're seeing in the children. And this is in their lymphocytes right out of the body. This isn't the cell lines now. We're, we're back to the lymphocytes. Or I'm sorry, we're back to the plasma. So we, we already know the plasma, GSH, GSSG is down. Nitrotyrosine is a reflection of protein oxidative damage. Tyrosine is an amino acid in, in proteins that can become nitrosylated under oxidative stress. So nitrotyrosine, actually, of all of the things we measure, I would say nitrotyrosine is most consistently up in the kids. It's, it's amazing how high it is, and we're just starting some intervention studies um, to show that it does drop uh, with uh, intervention. So I, I, I love this marker, and I think Jim has seen it as well. I think John Green has seen it as well. Um, there's a kit for nitrotyrosine. We do it with HPLC, which is really the, the, the best way to look at it. So I, I really am very impressed with that data. Chlor chlorotyrosine is another um, mo oxidized modification of, of tyrosine from hypochlorous acid, and hypochlorous acid is released um, from neutrophils during an infl inflammation. So again, this is, says that proteins uh, are more oxidized in the kids compared to age match control children. And then this one is kind of like the 5-methylcytosine. We use mass spec to measure it. Um, you're, you're with, with the 5-methylcytosine, we're measuring a difference of a methyl group in, in cytosine. Here we're looking at an oxyguanine, uh, deoxyguanine in, um, in the DNA from the children. This is the lymphocytes directly out of the children showing that, that the adoxyguanine is elevated. And there's a good repair mechanism for adoxyguanine, but when it's in the DNA, it says it's still there, it's not being repaired, and, it, and the DNA is more oxidized. This is on a global level, whether the gene or the whatever, wherever the adoxyguanine is, we don't know. This is just measuring, on average, uh, global DNA, but it's, but it's consistent with uh, chronic pro-oxidant condition in the kids. So our working hypothesis is that our evidence of metabolic imbalance in the moms and the children with autism supports a hypothesis, which is all we have in science are hypotheses, that impaired methylation capacity and increased oxidative stress damage may contribute to the development and clinical manifestations of autism. 
And I always like to end with this slide because this is the biochemistry of life. This is every reaction in the cell. It's on my wall, and you can look up your reaction like a map on H3 or whatever. And I just like to point out humbly that we think this is an important pathway, but it's all we know. And there's a lot out there that we don't know. And I just wanted to end with acknowledging the people in the lab uh, whose expertise and dedication to you families is incredible. Stefan is our uh, HPLC guru, and Stephanie does the genotyping with Tim. Shannon Palmer, I am so proud of her. She is 23, and she's a pre-doctoral student. Her brother is autistic, and she wants to do autism research for her career. And we just, actually last week, we were screaming. We were so happy. We just got funded for her thesis project, which will be looking at mitochondrial uh, abnormalities in um, lymphoblastoid cell lines in depth. I mean, much, taking what we have and going much, much further. Sarah Blossom uh, is an instructor at um, at, children, at UMS, or University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. She has a mouse model of um, autism um, that we're hoping to be funded. We, she's writing an NIH grant at, at, as we speak. And Lessa is Stepan's uh, helper, and I have uh, three wonderful nurse, nurses who do the recruiting, which is huge nowadays. I have to tell you, HIPAA and uh, IRB, which is the Human Use Committee, restrictions and regulations uh, are crippling uh, clinical research. And uh, <laughs> Jim, do you agree with me? I mean, I hate to complain, but it's just awful. It's so much paperwork um, that it just makes you crazy. But our study nurses take care of that. And again, um, the families in autism are in Arkansas are wonderful, and without them, we would have nothing. So thank you very much. This is my ex-life of them. Sometimes something gets out of our control. And that's what's happening with the immune system of kids with autism very often, too. So it's one of those things that seems like a big step to do, but it's really well worth it considering all the wonderful nutritional value that you get out of it. But they did find that if from just from delaying the vaccine, the DTP vaccine, from two months to four months, there was a 50% reduction in asthma. And guess what? The second strongest stimulus, gluten. That can affect sleep, it can affect um, development and cognitive function also.